Hello? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> good morning, church. Oh, okay. Good. good morning for half of you then, I guess. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thankful for the opportunity to turn our attention towards God's Word. Opportunity to worship with you this morning. It's always a privilege. I have one simple goal this morning. As the busyness of life, certainly you're in the midst of it now and it's approaching quickly as the seasons change. I want to simply remind you of the mission that we have as believers and to encourage you to live your life according to that mission. Think with me, if you will, to the beginning of the Bible. The very opening verse Moses records for us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Some 6,000 years ago, God spoke the world into existence. In six literal days, he, as the masterful artist, crafted the world and all that exist. There was beauty and elegance. There was purpose and intentionality. And the scripture tells us that on day six, he formed the crowning jewel of creation, man and woman, and he blessed them. God saw all that he had made and without another opinion to be sought because no one else was present at creation, he declared that his creation was very good. The world was right side up. Sometime after this, the Bible introduces us to the crafty serpent. With deception dripping from his hissing tongue, he convinced Eve and her husband Adam, who was with her, that eating of the fruit that God had forbidden was something to be desired. Although God commanded them not to eat of the tree or they would surely die, the serpent deluded them into thinking that not only was God lying, but he did not have their best interest in mind. And so the Bible records for us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Through this one act of disobedience, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And for the first time in human history, the world was upside down. Where God created life, there was now death. Where God created beauty and excellence, there was grotesque and coarseness. And where intentionality once resided, now there was chaos. The world was upside down. But one of the side effects of this sting of death was that the crowning jewel of creation, mankind, will become familiar and comfortable with this disordered world. Mankind no longer feels the nausea of being upended and overturned. Mankind no longer desires to understand what the creator thinks. Mankind is okay with being capsized and in a disarray. It's now become the new norm. The world is still upside down. You feel this, right? You know this to be true. Just to walk around our community, you can feel this. Consider with me, friends. That to agree, to agree with the Bible that God created man and woman only is a problem. To affirm that there are only two genders and your gender always agrees with your sex and your sex always agrees with the organs on your body the day that you were born. From our society, at best is considered to be narrow-minded and at worst considered hate speech. Or consider to agree with God that marriage, by definition, is the lifelong covenant between one man and one woman committed to each other alone until natural death separates them. By our society, at best is considered to be outdated and at worst considered an act of discrimination. Friends, the world is upside down. You feel it, right? But take heart. Because God knows 
God has determined to set the world right side up again. He is committed to reverse the curse of human history and to restore the beauty and the bliss that once existed. His word makes this very clear. And he's also done something else. Throughout redemptive history, he has sent men to echo this truth. The world has trouble receiving these men. These men are determined to live according to the precepts set by God. Their devotion is to their master who is in heaven. And so when these men in the world come in contact with one another, from the world's perspective, these men are turning the world upside down. This world and its system that's resolved to suppress the truth and unrighteousness see these men of God as upsetting the system, establishing a new foreign set of morals and values and turning the world upside down. But from God's perspective, they're simply turning the world right side up again, reestablishing what was always meant to be. Do you remember Elijah? Elijah was a prophet during the time of King Ahab's reign. King Ahab was an evil man. He was a wicked ruler in Israel, and the only person who was possibly more wicked than him was his wife Jezebel. See, Elijah, when he ministered during that time, his desire was for the people of Israel to worship Yahweh only. First King records this for us in chapter 18, verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go on limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. It's simple. Worship Yahweh alone or worship Baal. See, Elijah desired for the people to do the righteous thing. To worship Yahweh only. But look at how King Ahab, the the king of Israel during this time, viewed Elijah. In that same chapter, if you back up to verse 17, we read this. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? See, Abraham, Abraham, Ahab understood Elijah to be troubling the people of Israel upsetting the system from his perspective elijah was turning the world upside down but what was the true perspective verse 18 helps us he elijah answered ahab and he said this i have not troubled israel but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the lord and followed the baals See, Ahab, he was so familiar and so comfortable with the world being upside down that from his perspective, Elijah was guilty of flipping the world upside down. And this morning, Dr. Luke will narrate a very similar situation for us. So if you have your copy of God's inspired word, I'll ask you to open up to Acts chapter 1. We'll spend a little bit of time here before we get to our text because I want to set the context of Luke for you to help you understand what's going on in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Now the book of Acts theme is very simple. The book of Acts is showing how God's promise in the old covenant concerning the nations are coming to pass. God's promised program of salvation coming to the nation is actually being realized in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a continuation of Luke's gospel. In fact, the two manuscripts will often travel together in the ancient world. Look at Acts 1.1. It says, in the first book, he's referring to Luke's gospel account. O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, this is very important for us. The technical term for this is called a resumptive prologue. And it's important because Acts itself does not state an aim or a purpose. And so Acts, because it's a part of Luke's gospel and a continuation, it adopts the same purpose as Luke's gospel. Turn with me, if you will, 
to Luke chapter 1. I should have made you go here to begin with, right? Luke chapter 1, where we'll read Luke's purpose for writing these two accounts that act as one account. In verses 1 through 4, Luke, inspired by the Spirit, he writes, And as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some times past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Here's the purpose, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Everything that Luke writes in these two accounts, the Gospel of Luke and Acts, is meant to give the reader certainty of the things that he's been taught. Luke does painstaking research. He is interviewing eyewitnesses of the things that have occurred so that he can communicate with clarity and with accuracy the things that have been taught thereby Theophilus and by extension you and I this morning can have certainty of the things that he records. When you read Luke and Acts you should read them as one thought and the purpose and why Luke is writing these two accounts come together when you consider them together. It helps me, because I have a little mind, to think about it as an hourglass. You have, in the beginning, in the opening chapters of Luke's gospel, Luke starts with this wide-angle view of mankind. The, the entire world is in focus as he explains this worldwide census that Caesar Augusta has com commanded to happen. And then Luke, he narrows his focus in onto the life of Christ. He talks about Christ's life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And then Luke ends his gospel account in Luke 24 with the ascension of Christ into heaven. And then as we open up the book of Acts to begin with, that same scene is in focus. The ascension of Christ is in focus. Christ is giving his disciples his final marching orders before he ascends into heaven. And from that point, Luke then again widens his view to the rest of the world as the gospel is spreading across the world, ending with Paul in Rome. What is Luke trying to emphasize for us? He's stressing that the life of Christ has had an impact on the entire world. He wants you, as you're reading this, to see that this central focus of Christ has this impacted everywhere. We read it earlier. He emphasizes this. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1 again, if you're still there. We read it earlier. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. The implication here is that if Luke's first account, his gospel, deals with all that Jesus began to do and teach, Acts then acts as the record of the continuation of Christ's work. Christ is still working from Luke's perspective from heaven through the apostles. His work is being accomplished through the spread of the gospel. And Luke highlights the spread of the gospel in three simple sections echoing Jesus' final marching orders to the disciples. Look at Acts chapter 1, verses 8, verse 8, and you will see his marching orders. Jesus here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is speaking to the disciples and he says to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Luke uses this marching orders from Jesus to structure the way that he writes the book of Acts. From chapters 1 to 8, you read about the gospel going out in Jerusalem. In chapters 9 through 12, you read about the gospel going out to Judea and Samaria. And then in chapters 13 through 28, you read about the gospel going to the ends of the earth. However, 
Luke is not merely emphasizing geographical locations. He's not trying to help us merely understand that these men are going to witness in different areas. Because the locations that he mentions are not of the same magnitude. Look at verse 8 again. He says, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city. Then he says, Judea and Samaria. Well, that's a region. And then he uses this phrase, the ends of the earth. And this phrase is taken from the book of Isaiah, and it indicates the Gentile nations. So Jesus Marching orders are not only telling the disciples where they will witness, but the impact that their witness will have. Their final marching orders for these men are indicating that they were going to uproot societal norms. The truth of the Jewish Messiah was going to go to all the nations. The gospel will go forth and it will engage with all strands of society. And as it does, it will turn the world upside down. And our text for this morning demonstrates this explicitly. So if you still have your Bibles open to Acts, turn to chapter 17. And that's where we'll spend the majority of our time this morning. Acts chapter 17. And if you will stand with me and we'll read verses 1 through 9. And then we'll beg the Lord for his help. Acts chapter 17, verse 1 through 9. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Verse 4, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowds. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken the money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Let's pray. Our great God, we come to you because there's nowhere else to go. For you are the high king of heaven. You rule and you reign and you go unmatched by anyone or anything. You are so kind to us to allow us to gather here today and to worship you, to humble ourselves under the truth of your scripture and to be encouraged or what our Savior has to say to us through the scriptures. And so we pray for your help. We pray that you would help us to do this. Please remove the distractions from our minds and our hearts. Teach us, Lord Jesus. Feed your sheep. Dear Spirit, I pray that you would open up our minds to understand the truth and to not only understand it, but have willing hearts that are ready to be obedient and to put it into practice. These things are impossible for us to do without your help, and so we beg for it. Help us to be these people that you've called us to be. Help us to remember the mission that you've left us here to fulfill. Help us to be men and women who can live lives that turn the world upside down. 
pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Christian, as you make your pilgrimage through this world, I want to encourage you to live your life in such a way that you may turn the world upside down. And this morning, I want to simply answer the question of how you do that. How do you live in such a way to turn the world upside down? We'll look at four attitudes you must have in order to do that. The first attitude you must have in order to turn the world upside down is confidence in God's plan. Confidence in God's plan. Verse 1 now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Here we have Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveling along an ancient road or an ancient highway called the Ignatian Way. They're traveling from Philippi. And their first stop as they're traveling from Philippi is Amphipolis. It's 30 miles southwest of Philippi. And from there they go to Apollonia, which is 30 miles southwest from Amphipolis. And they finally arrive in Thessalonica, which is 40 miles south of Apollonia. Luke, here he could be identifying just the three major cities that they stopped at along the way as they made a long journey, or he could be indicating to us that it took them three days to arrive in Thessalonica from Philippi. If that's the case, it would indicate that Paul and his companions are traveling by horse, and they come to these three cities, and they do not stay there and witness and minister. They stay the night, and they move on. Now, I think that this is true if they traveled in three days, that they would have to have been on horseback because this is a hundred mile journey that they're taking. And to take that by foot would take more than three days, especially if you consider that in chapter 16, Luke tells us that they have just been beaten and imprisoned while they were in Philippi. But what Luke makes clear is that they do not stop to minister in Apollonia or Amphipolis. Some scholars suggest that it's because there's no synagogue there in those two cities. It's been proven that there has, there's not one or has not been. Uh, and it may be that Paul viewed Thessalonica as a strategic center for spreading the gospel. This could be the motivation of Paul and Silas as they're pushing through the pain of recently, recently being beaten to make this 100-mile journey over to Thessalonica. And so they arrived there. Thessalonica was founded in 315 B.C. and its population was estimated somewhere around about 200,000 people. So with this large city in the ancient world, it could be Paul's thought is this is a perfect hub for promoting the gospel. And the scriptures confirm for us that this is exactly what happened after Paul ministered there. If you remember in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes back to the church, and he says this in verses 6 through 8 to them. Speaking to the church in Thessalonica, he says, You have become imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Paul, as he writes back to this church, it's clear that he is proud of the work that God has done there and the way that they have acted and the way that they've spread their faith. But we're looking at what happens when Paul first gets there. Look at verse 1. It says, They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue, And Paul went in as was his custom. And here, my friends, is where we see Paul's confidence in God's plan. What happened to Paul every time he went into a synagogue to preach the gospel? It starts with P, rhymes with persecution. Every single time Paul went to minister the gospel in the synagogue, he was met with persecution. People who despise the message that he had. Look at Acts 13, Acts 14, Acts 18, Acts 19. Every time he's 
met with persecution. Paul expects persecution. Christ said that he would suffer for him in Acts chapter 9. But the, Paul, the prospect of trials and persecution does not deter Paul from going where God called him to minister. He has confidence enough in God's plan to follow through with his mission. Now, think with me, friends, because Paul is not coming from vacation when he lands in Thessalonica. He's just come from Philippi, right? He's been beaten. He's Feet has been put in stocks. He spent the night in prison worshiping. He has made a hundred mile journey before he gets here. And despite the persecution that Paul faced in Philippi at the hands of the Gentiles, Paul does not hesitate to courageously enter into the synagogue in Thessalonica, knowing that the likely outcome would be that he would be persecuted. Paul trusts in God's plan. And he's seeking to evangelize those who would be present at this uh, synagogue. I think Paul understood that he would have points of commonality with these people. I mean, he's a Jew and they're a Jew. They love the scriptures. Paul loved the scriptures. Easy, right? Paul's determined to make these quick connections with these people in a synagogue establishing a point of contact as fast as he can so that he can promote the gospel and he's doing it regardless to what might come. The certainty of persecution does not deter Paul from entering into the synagogue and yet we make excuses for talking to our family members. They just don't understand. I can't share the gospel with them. Or what about your co-workers? Oh, he's too far gone. We make excuses in these areas that we already have commonality. And here Paul is seeking to make points of connection so that he can promote the gospel. What about your neighbor? I mean, y'all share a sewer system. Can you get any closer than that? Paul expected to be beaten, to be persecuted And we avoid awkward situations. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to live lives in a way that will turn this world upside down, we must live with confidence in God's plan of salvation and put ourselves in situations regardless to the harm. Embrace dangerous situations. Be willing to have awkward dinners. There's nothing wrong with silence. Make connections that lead to gospel conversations and be willing to promote the gospel regardless to what it costs you. Do you do volunteer work at a youth center? Maybe a tutoring program? Do you coach a sport? All of these could be used as opportunities to promote Christ's agenda, to promote Christ as king, to promote Christ as Lord, to promote Christ as the only way to salvation. Maybe even you will take walks with your neighbors or maybe you go to the same restaurant so that you can establish connections with people that work there all of these are avenues that we can use in our lives to make connections to promote God's agenda so how are you doing with that the idea is to work play and enjoy life with gospel intentionality while being prepared to embrace whatever happens Why? Because you have confidence in God's plan of salvation. Look with me at the second attitude that you'll need to have in order to live a life that will turn the world upside down. It's trust in God's message. You need confidence in God's plan and you need trust in God's message. Starting in verse 2, Paul went in as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Luke tells us for three weeks, Paul is going into the synagogue and he's reasoning with people. This word reasoning is Interesting, it's to discuss or converse. 
The Greek word would be the root that we get our word dialogue from. He's simply talking to these people about the scriptures and from the scriptures. As their questions would arise, he would address their questions. As their concerns came up, he would address their concerns. He would open up the scriptures and explain to them and instruct to them, this is what the scriptures are saying. He simply trusts in what God has already revealed. This term that Luke uses here is the terminology that is uh, for formal rhetoric. It it means the, the art of persuasion. Paul has an open Bible in his hand and he is persuading these men to trust in what the scriptures say. He's not using his own opinion. He's not relying on his own wisdom. He has an open Bible and he's pointing out to them what the Bible has to say. And what is he trying to convince these people of? Pretty simple. Two things there in your text. One, Explaining and proving it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. He wanted to prove to them that the Messiah foretold in the Old Testament scriptures would indeed suffer, would indeed die, and would indeed be raised from the dead. And then he convinces them that this Jesus I proclaim to you is the Christ. He wants to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. Two simple truths. Paul is, it says, explaining to them in the ESV. The Greek word could be interpreted. It's, it's, it carries the understanding of opening something up widely to make the content visible. He's trying to make clear to them what the scripture says, and then it says he's proving. He's explaining, and he's proving. This means to set the evidence before. In fact, the, the, the NASB actually translates this, giving evidence. He's pointing to the scriptures and he's saying, listen, this is what it says concerning the Messiah. Paul has an Old Testament Bible in his hand and he's pointing out and he's explaining what the text says. He's trusting in God's word to do the work. He doesn't have some six steps to a better life plan for these people. Paul is not interested in reasoning from any human philosophy or the new psychological data. He simply has an open Bible and he's explaining what God had already revealed. He is interested in using God's word to address these people's unbelief. He doesn't want anything new. He doesn't need the new and vogue way of ministering. Just simple. Open Bible, expounding what the Bible has to say. See, trust in God's plan, confidence in God's plan must be coupled with the proper message that God has provided. If the believers are to live and to upset and overturn the world. To have the right message, but then not have the boldness to proclaim that message renders the message useless. But to promote Error causes harm. Paul here, he just is telling them what the Bible has to say. Proclaiming the truth with boldness is what turned this world upside down. And this is important because the common Jewish understanding would have been that the Messiah, he was coming to be sort of a conquering political ruler. Every thought that they had was that the Messiah was coming to conquer all the other nations. He would be someone who would defeat their enemies and then usher in the new kingdom. The thought that the Messiah came to die and that he would die at the hands of the very people that he came to save was an inconceivable thought to the Jewish mind. And so Paul is opening up the scriptures and he's helping them to see that this is the case. He's reasoning from the scriptures to make an argument. He's not using the Bible in some superficial or mystical way. He's speaking to these people. He's dialoguing with them. He's speaking rationally and logically to his audience. He is speaking to their intellect with the hopes that God will grasp their heart with the message. We don't know for sure how he convinced them or what verses he went to in the Bible 
make a couple guesses. Maybe he used the sacrificial system of Moses. Maybe he went to Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53 to prove that the Messiah had to suffer. I would be convinced that he went to Psalm 16 in order to prove that the Messiah will be raised from the dead. We don't know for sure. Luke doesn't tell us in this account here. But what we do know is that Paul is not leaning on what he thinks. He's leaning on what's been revealed in God's word. He says it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And Jesus is who is the Christ. See, brothers and sisters, our primary duty in evangelism is to demonstrate the validity and the truthfulness of Christianity from the scriptures. We rely on God's word to make our case. We lean on what God has already revealed. It's enough. We don't need anything new. New gimmicks are useless. We just need the word. You know, we'll encounter a lot of people who know stories in the Bible, who know a little bit of scripture here and there, right? You come across this. But what people often don't understand is the entire storyline of scripture. So we have the wonderful opportunity to tell people the greatest story ever told. We have the opportunity to show them how redemptive history flows throughout human history and it culminates in the person of Jesus Christ who is the Redeemer who came to reconcile sinners back to God. That's the privilege that you and I as believers get. But brothers and sisters, you know what this means. We have to understand what the scriptures say. And so yes, this is a read your Bible more sermon. But how can you be more effective at utilizing the Bible? How can you study God's word in such a way that you become an effective tool in God's hand as you promote the gospel? Here's a list of a few things you can do. I borrowed it, so don't give me credit for it, but it's good. First, keep a short account of sins with God. Repentance. Confession of sin. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, if we have unconfessed sin in our life, we can't come to the scriptures and expect the Holy Spirit to grant us understanding. And so we must repent of our sins as we approach God's word and we humble ourselves under it, knowing that it takes the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds. So keep a short account of sins with the Lord. Second, be diligent to study. Be diligent to study God's truth. I think this has an implication of frequency as well of quality how often you study and how you study paul says this to timothy in second timothy 2 15 do your best to present yourself to god as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth it's, it's a responsibility of yours to put yourself before the scripture and seek to understand what it's saying. Mind the depths and the truths of scripture that God may reveal unto you its meaning. Careless and lazy Bible study does not produce effectiveness. We have a responsibility in it. Study in such a way that what was said of Apollos can be said of you. This is what Acts Acts records of Apollos. Luke writes of him. He was an eloquent man. And then he says, competent in the scriptures. Wouldn't that be nice to have on your gravestone? Competent in the scriptures. So study. Thirdly, you must practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. James says it this way. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away at once and forget what he was like. 
but the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres being a hearer who, uh, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James 1, 22 through 25. The goal, brothers and sisters, when we study the Bible is not to merely gain biblical information, but to gain holiness in Christ's likeness to grow in the truth as we practice the truth. But we must come to it to understand it. And then we can implement it. So practice what you preach. And then lastly, teach others. This is simple. As you study to teach, you always study a little bit harder. And as you teach others, you realize what you truly know. Paul, again, writing to Timothy, says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You take the biblical information in, and you reproduce it to someone else. You teach them. This verse is the very reason why I named my son what he is. In Ezra 17, it says, For Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. He studied, he practiced, and then he taught others. That's what we have to do. So study God's word. It's a privilege that we have to be able to communicate God's truth to other people. So let's take advantage of it. And study to show ourselves approved. Look with me, if you will, at the third attitude we need to have to turn the world upside down. An expectation that God will save souls. An expectation that God will save souls. Paul says, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And Luke records, and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Brothers and sisters, please understand this, that if the world is going to be turned upside down, if we're going to reverse the curse as God's instruments, as Jesus works through us, we cannot do that alone. We need others. And so we must expect that God will be saving souls as we go along the way. You know, this was convicting to me as I studied this. Because I'm guilty of oftentimes sharing the gospel without the real expectation that God will use that gospel message right then and there to save that soul. I'm sure some of you are just as guilty as I am. I understand that. For most, it takes being confronted with the gospel message multiple times before they believe. But I don't believe that that gives us a license to share the gospel message without an expectation that God will actually use it there to save them. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you God is sovereign in salvation. The Spirit alone is the one who grants the new birth and causes dead souls to come to life. But the gospel is the mean that God has chosen to impart that life into dead souls. So why would I share it without the expectation that he will use it? I should be surprised after I share the gospel message that someone doesn't come to faith. It should be staggering to me. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, right? So if we're going to turn the world upside down, we must be confronting complacent sinners who are stuck in the goo of their sin and are seemingly okay with it, with the life-transforming message of the gospel, with the full expectation that God will use it to save their souls. Many of these men in the synagogue who were persuaded by Paul were not expecting the gospel message to come to them. And many of you might have walked in here this morning and wasn't expecting the gospel message to come to you. But here we are. You're a sinner. You're lost in your sins. And not only are you lost in your sins, but you've sinned against a holy and a righteous God who demands justice. His justice will be an eternal punishment of your soul in hell. Hell. 
He demands a, a, a retribution for every sin that you've ever done. And he will personally uh, put the penalty upon you. He himself will punish you for your sins because he's holy and he must do so. But this same God who is holy, righteous, and justice sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent his son to live a life that you could not live and to die a death that you deserve so that he can freely forgive you of your sins and so that you can be reconciled back to God. See, life Christ lived a perfect life, a spotless life. He never sinned. When you and I sinned, he never did. When you and I think of sinning, he never did. He lived a perfect, spotless, blameless life. And so he earned the right to be in God's presence. But he didn't slavishly hold on to that for himself. He went to the cross as a substitute. The Bible says God made him who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf so that you can be forgiven of your sins. God placed the punishment you deserve on Christ so that he can forgive you. And he proved that he accepted Christ's sacrifice because on the third day he raised him from the grave. And now he stands willing to offer life to anyone who will come to him in faith. And so I plead with you today, turn from your sins and turn to Christ. He's your only hope. If you walk from here, you won't have another chance because tomorrow is not promised to you. Today could be the day of your salvation. So repent, I beg of you, and turn to Christ. He's your only hope. These men in the synagogue were not expecting to encounter God that day, just like you were not. But look at what the text says. They were persuaded. They came to believe. It's an interesting word, not a word that we're used to seeing when it talks about faith. The faith that we are usually used to seeing. Look at verse 10 through 15. In verses 10 through 15 of the same chapter, it talks about how Paul goes to Berea. And Luke describes the Bereans as being more noble-minded because they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. Starting in verse 10, it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They left Thessalonica to go to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Verse 12, many of them therefore believed. See, this is the word that we become familiar with when we talk about faith in the Lord Jesus, this pastuo, this belief, this faith in Christ. I think Luke is trying to help us understand that not everyone comes to salvation the same way. See, these Thessalonians, they were noble-minded. They searched the scriptures on their own. But I'm sorry, the Bereans searched the scriptures on their own. But the Thessalonians, they had to be persuaded. They had to be convinced from the scriptures that it was true. Paul had to tell them. They didn't go back and look it up on their own. He had to show them how these things were so. You ever meet someone and you share the gospel with them, and they almost seem like they were waiting for God to send someone to give them the message. It's like an anticipation on their heart. They're ready to hear the message. They receive it with gladness. They're open and willing to hear. That's like the Bereans. They, they were waiting for God to send someone to them, and they flipped through their Bibles to see if it was so. But the Thessalonians is more like me. He had to be persuaded. Someone had to convince them that these things were true. You might meet some people who are ready to receive God. It almost seems as if they are searching for God themselves. But you also might meet someone who's cold and hard-hearted and rotten and atheistic towards God. But brothers and sisters, both of them equally can be won to the Lord by the same message. It's the same gospel that saves them. Paul preached the same thing in both places, the same Christ, the same Christ crucified and him resurrected. They can be persuaded. So let me encourage you, because I know there are some of these people in your life. Be patient. Be winsome. Seek to persuade them. Open up the scriptures. Read it with them. Teach it to them. 
be kind, answer their questions, but always have the expectation that God will save their soul. Always be ready for the day when their hearts and their eyes are open to the truth. We have a wonderful message we get to preach. We have a wonderful opportunity to tell the world about this Christ, him crucified and resurrected. And so let's be expecting that God will do what he said. Use the power of the gospel to save souls. Look at the fourth and final attitude you must have if you're going to be someone who turns the world upside down. It's an anticipation of gospel confrontation. Verse 5 says, But when the Jews, I'm sorry, but the Jews were jealous, and taking some of the wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken the money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. This last attitude must be adopted, this anticipation of gospel confrontation, because it's always the result. Conflict is always the result for someone who trusts in God's plan, who trusts in God's word, and who are expecting souls to be saved. You will meet confrontation. You will meet people who will reject the message you have to say. But brothers and sisters, be prepared for the opposition. Expect it. It's going to come. Paul's success in the synagogue, it says, stirred jealousy within the heart of these people, these Jews. And so they gathered some people. The expression is kind of weird. It's for unemployed people who linger around the market. They ain't got nothing better to do, so they're just hanging out at the market. But then Luke puts paneros with it. It's a word for evil. These evil people who hang around at the market. And that's where you get this understanding of rabble from. These uh, no good, low lives. Grandma would call them hooligans. These hooligans, the Jews gather them up. They have nothing better to do. They're looking for trouble. And so they form a mob and set the city in an uproar. And this is interesting. This is the very thing that they accuse the Christians of doing. You ever been called a hater for preaching Christ as the only way? for saying that you don't have the right to choose your own gender, for standing on what God says? You ever been called evil for that? It's the same thing that happened to Paul. It's the same thing that happened to Silas. Expect it. It's coming. And friends, it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. So be rooted and be ready. Look at the three charges they level against them. These men have turned... Did I run out of... Okay, there we go. Thank you. They were charged for causing an uproar war. The word uh, tends to uh, carry the understanding of overturning or overthrowing or subverting. They're subverting the world, causing trouble everywhere. Where there's stability, they're creating instability. But what were they doing? Was Paul fighting people? Was he... What was he doing? Preaching the gospel. He's simply here telling the truth of Scripture. Paul was simply sharing the gospel and nothing else. And they said they caused an uproar. I like it. Nothing in Paul's character caused trouble. This is not Paul being brash. When I say anticipate com confrontation, that does not mean create confrontation. Don't be offensive for offensive sake if you're brash and you have a brash personality practice gentleness if you have harsh words let your words be seasoned with love and grace if your breath stinks brush your teeth like <laughs> don't be offensive for offensive sake let the things that you say to people be the stumbling block let christ's message and him being lord and king alone be what causes people to stumble 
Look at the second charge. It's level against Jason. He received them, so he's guilty of harboring criminals. And then the third one is the real bad one. They are acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. This is treason. This is sedition. It's funny, though. You see, the people understood the implications of the message. See, the gospel goes forth as Christ being Savior and what? Lord. He's king of your life. And the people understood what they were saying. The most serious crime that you can be charged with in the Roman Empire was to be a treason against the king. This was the very same charge that they level against our Savior. Do you remember in Luke chapter 23? He is claiming to be king. Jesus had to die the death of a sedition even though he wasn't a seditious person. There's a truth in this. Jesus is king. This is not a mere accusation without merit, but it lacks some truthfulness because there's no effort to overthrow Caesar. And the Bible is very clear about this. First Peter uh, 2.17 says, Honor the king. Our Lord even said, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And so as Christ is king in our lives, that does not mean we start an uproar for no reason. And so here's my question to you, brothers and sisters. Is Christ king over your life? Do you organize your life in such a way that people can look at you and accurately understand that Jesus is king of your life? What about your time? If we were to rewind the tapes of your life, will we see that Jesus is the king of your life? Are you living in such a way to turn the world upside down, reflecting that you follow Christ? What about your agenda? If we looked at your calendar, or mine's is on my Mac, so if we looked at your calendar, would, would we see that your calendar agrees with Jesus being king of your life, with being Lord? Or does it say, I follow the rules of Caesar? My time is my time. My retirement is my retirement. My money is my money. Or does it show that Jesus is Lord and King of your life? Brothers and sisters, there's work to do. There are people in our city that are dying and going to hell. There are people in our city who need to hear the truth of the gospel. And we have been given the privilege of being heralds of the truth. So let's go get them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that you've saved us, that you've drew us out of darkness, and that you've made us workers in your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would light a flame in each one of our hearts to go and take not only this city by storm, but this nation and this world. Help us to live lives that show We are willing and ready for your sake to turn the world upside down. Spirit, we need your help. We can't do it by ourselves. And so we beg of you, please help. In Christ's name, amen. I invite you to stand. We'll finish singing, O church, arise. We'll sing verse 1, 2.